one of the most vexing aspects of science is that for every problem you solve, sometimes you create two more problems, problems you would have never anticipated. Such is the case with the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang model is spectacularly successful, and it's about to celebrate 100 years of successful observations and confrontation with theory. The Big Bang model is spectacularly successful at explaining large-scale features of our universe, and yet it still has its own gaps, gaps that the theory of inflation was designed to solve. But inflation, too, has its own challenges, challenges that perhaps can be solved with new models, models known as bouncing cosmologies. And that's what today's subject is all about. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Science is sometimes described as long periods of boredom punctuated by periods of pure terror. Such is the case with the Big Bang model, which solved many problems in the previously existing steady state universe. But in turn, for every problem that it was designed to solve, more problems emerged. Problems that we've talked about in other videos. Today's video tackles problems that inflation was purported to solve, and yet Inflation, too, like the Big Bang, like almost all of science, creates new problems for each one of its successes. Come along with me today into the impossible to learn more about alternatives to inflation. And we'll find out, these have their own problems as well. I've talked a lot in this channel about inflation and how spectacularly successful it is. I've talked about the motivation for inflation and why we needed something like inflation to explain the lacunae, the gaps in the Big Bang model. That was part of what inflation was designed to do. But inflation has challenges too, challenges we've talked about, first and foremost among them, the multiverse issue that has been the subject of many discussions on this channel. With each one of the Big Bang's successes comes a challenge. The successes are manifold, but there are flaws as well, perhaps equally significant. The biggest challenge to the Big Bang in many cosmologists' minds is the so-called singularity that is thought to have initiated the Big Bang itself, where all the matter in the universe, all of cosmic energy and matter was perhaps compressed into an infinitesimal point. At such a point, in the absence of a good theory for quantum gravity, all hell breaks loose. So it would be nice to have a theory that makes the same large-scale predictions of the evolution, the composition, and the large-scale properties of our universe that doesn't rely on a singularity to get the whole thing started off. I've described in this channel how inflation shouldn't be thought of as the cosmic genesis event. Inflation is spectacularly successful at explaining the large-scale features of the universe, including its structure, its flatness, its the so-called horizon problem, the absence of magnetic monopoles. It also makes concrete predictions that there should exist at some level, possibly observable, possibly not, as we'll discuss in future videos, of so-called tensor perturbations, also known as B-mode polarization. That was the subject of my book, Losing the Nobel Prize, and the so-called Bicep 2 incident. We'll talk more about experimental techniques to pursue cosmic inflation in future videos. But there are problems in inflation as well. Most models of inflation are tacked onto a theory of the initial conditions of the universe, aka the Big Bang itself, when perhaps time came into existence. And these usually involve so-called singularities. Many inflation models also feature what is known as quantum runaway by its detractors, aka the multiverse problem, discussed in this video over here. We're not going to go back and recover that ground again. S suffice it to say, there is much controversy as to whether or not mu the multiverse is not only a problem for cosmology, but all of science, since it predicts an essential infinity of possible universes. There's also a fundamental problem that we'll talk about regarding the low initial entropy of the universe. That is a video that you can look forward to as well. But the question that we're gonna to ask today is, can inflation with all of its successes be replaced with a big bounce? Which is another way of saying a smooth transition from an early state of our universe into an expanding state that matches most of the large scale features of the Big Bang cosmology without requiring the so-called multiverse dimension. We've talked about alternatives, including Sir Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology, and even hinted at other explanations, such as the ekpyrotic theory, 
of Paul Steinhardt, Neil Turok, and others that involve brains and extra dimensions. Robert Brandenberger, my former uh, co-advisor at Brown University, he has a model known as string gas cosmology supported by other uh, cosmologists as well. And, uh, and it is noted that in many of these alternatives to inflation, they generate problems that are already in conflict with observations such as so-called non-Gaussianity, or they require some sort of very fine tuning of the initial conditions required during the contracting phase. But are these features generic? Do they occur in all collapsing and all expanding or all bouncing universes? Do they all require spectacularly fine-tuned uh, initial conditions? It's not clear. The cosmological models that we're going to describe today in bouncing cosmologies really only relies on the most simple ingredients, scalar fields, which exist in almost all cosmological models, and for which we have one example only in the Higgs boson, uh, but also the mere ingredients of the Einstein equations. Shown here, uh, there won't be a quiz on this, as is my want. However, I call your attention to the description as Einstein formulated it back in 1915. And that was that the left side of this equation describes how gravity affects trajectories. It changes the metric of space-time. We only need three dimensions of space, one ordinary dimension of time, in the bouncing models of Aegis and Steinhardt. The right-hand side of the Einstein equations is equivalent to the matter-energy content of the universe, sometimes called the stress energy. And that will include things like scalar fields, matter, radiation, uh, and the matter can be dark matter or ordinary matter. With these tools, we can explain how a bouncing cosmological model can generically predict the geodesic completion that is required to describe how uh, particles, how matter and energy evolve through this classical bounce. We don't need a quantum uh, event. So we can avoid the cosmic singularity that plagues the Big Bang. In other words, how do we uh, reconcile the existence of one infinite point in cosmic history where infinite temperature, infinite density reigned with the observation that nothing in nature is infinite, density, temperature, pressure, etc. Of course, the bouncing model must also have the successful uh, predictions that inflation does. Namely, it has to resolve the horizon problem, explain the smoothness and the flatness of the universe. It has to explain the absence of magnetic monopoles, perhaps. It also has to generate the successful predictions of so-called superhorizon scale density fluctuations. These are the fluctuations in the curvature, the small scale curvature of space time that later will seed reservoirs of dark matter, which will then seed reservoirs for ordinary matter, gravitational potential wells to fall into. Now we can later have structures like galaxies, clusters, planets, people, and podcasts. We also need to generate a mechanism to suppress the amplitude of B modes, of tensor fluctuations in the early universe. We also would like such models to avoid the problem of the multiverse, sometimes called by the authors quantum runaway. And we also have to explain, or we would like to explain the theory successfully considered to be so, would have an explanation why the entropy and the onset of the expanding phase, not the Big Bang, not the singularity, now we're just talking about the moment at which the universe began uh, expanding after a previously collapsing condition. Why was the entropy low at that stage? So that the arrow of time could point in the direction of increasing entropy to get to where we are today. The main features of the bouncing model uh, really revolve around this figure declared uh, by the authors to, to be a really simple kind of diagram that they call a wedge diagram. We're we'll working through it not in great detail, but we're gonna explain in the, well, what follows how it represents a solution that does not need the conditions of inflation to have a singularity, to have a multiverse and other issues. And yet it still is consistent with the observation of the universe being expanding and cooling since about 13.8 billion years ago. It also has to explain the uh, emergence of complex structures today because it came from a condition in the early universe that was remarkably smooth. About a time when the CMB was produced, the universe is about a thousandth of its current radius. And the last scattering surface shows a deviation from almost perfect uniformity at this tiny level that we've talked about in previ previous videos, with an RMS of amplitude of only about one part in 10 to the fourth. Incredibly smooth. So any viable theory has to agree with these observations and has to explain how the smoothness occurs on large scales and flatness as well, but also explain the small scale anisotropies that grow into the density fluctuations that produce galaxies and planets, etc. So the authors visualize this diagram, this wedge diagram, and they really only rely on two parameters, what we cosmologists call A of T, 
uh, and that describes the scale factor. It's a dimensionless quantity that sh demonstrates how much a patch of space changes in size due to the expansion or contraction of the observable universe. It corresponds to some radius today, the Hubble radius. And we could also uh, characterize another parameter, the so-called Hubble parameter, whose evaluation at the present time is the Hubble constant. Now, the Hubble parameter, generically speaking, is the first time derivative of the scale factor. Where do you get the scale factor from? You get that from solving the Friedman-Robertson-Walker equations. I'll show those here. Where do you get those? Those come from classical Einstein equations. We don't invoke Planck's constant or quantum cosmology at all in this framework. So it's very attractive for its simplicity and elegance. It's basically classical cosmology that we teach to our undergraduates, and all, the only two parameters we really need to keep track of are how the scale factor and the Hubble constant uh, evolve, or the Hubble parameter, evolve with time based on the amount of matter and energy density in the universe at a given moment. So while the authors can consider a series of infinite cycles of, of, of expansion and collapse, the collapse doesn't have to be to a singularity, so it can actually occur for a very long time. Such models have a long pedigree in cosmology, actually initially considered by uh, Tommy Gold and others, and rejected because they failed to resolve the problem of what do you do with all the entropy of the previous uh, of the previous cosmological epoch during a collapsing universe, and that is less of a problem in a very benign condensation almost, not even a collapse. We shouldn't think of it as anything near a black hole or a singularity. So the authors uh, generically can consider such models, but for simplicity, they consider just a single cycle. In other words, a previous um, uh, collapse and then an expansion after this collapse, which occurs at some point they call the bounce, and again, we can set that point arbitrarily far back in time. So one of the issues of Aegis and, and Steinhardt's model has typically been this question of geodesic completeness. Whether or not every particle that is a, ex, participating in the expansion of the universe has a world line, a past history, your world line is your own past history from birth to where you are now, through four-dimensional space-time. Does geodesic completeness hold? In other words, can you complete the trajectory back through the bounds arbitrarily far back to cosmic history? In the limit that such a cosmology is past geodesically complete, we can have such well-behaved behaviors, unlike cosmologies, according to the authors, that have a singularity. Because in such situations, the singularity means that you can't uniquely associate a geodesic with any individual particle's history. One of the virtues of the bouncing model is that by design, the energy density never becomes infinite. In other words, there is no such thing as a singularity. And it actually holds at all stages, even below the Planck density, when quantum gravity would be expected to make a large effect. To Aegis and Steinhardt, this is a good point because it actually provides us an empirical test that you could look for the large scale properties of our observable universe and rely on them to be insensitive to any details of quantum gravitational nature. Now, you might want to understand quantum gravity, as they point out, to understand uh, the fundamental unification of forces and fields in physics, but we've also talked about in this channel, there's no guarantee that there is a quantum theory of gravity. There's no law from, of nature that says you must have all forces be unified. It's just a desire. Obviously, because there is no singular, no uh, quantum gravitational epoch in a bouncing model, you don't have to explain the transition from quantum to classical. That's a bonus, if it can be achieved. So it's always classically evolving, and that's thought to be very nice, because we don't have to rely on a yet unknown theory of quantum gravity. So what happens to particles? In this figure, that they call figure three, these particle trajectories spend an infinite, or semi-infinite rather, period of contraction within a causally connected common region, a cosmological horizon. Then there's a tiny interlude, which is finite in time, both before and after the bounce, when the horizon size becomes small, so small compared to the patch, rather, that most of these world lines lie outside of the horizon. After that period, the horizon size grows fast enough to re-enclose and encompass all trajectories to this day. For most of cosmic history, though, the patch was uh, corresponding to our observable universe has been causally connected, which is a nice property of, of bouncing cosmology, which then allows us to resolve some of the classic problems in the Big Bang model. We talked about how inflation resolves it via this early period of thermal equilibrium before this massive expansion takes place. These models of bouncing or cyclic models, in this case, do not have such a horizon problem to contend with. 
The horizon problem comes about in Big Bang cosmology because the patch that corresponds to our universe was never connected in the past, and you need to bolt on this inflationary growth, exponential faster than light growth, at early epochs, not the time equals zero epoch as we talked about, but sometime shortly thereafter, maybe a million Planck times afterwards. But you don't need this in bouncing cosmology. So the ratio between the horizon size and the patch size that later becomes our universe decreases extrapolating back in time as the scale factor, A of t, decreases as you go back to earlier and earlier times. Now, this behavior must change once you get to the bounce if you're thinking backwards in time. The horizon size grows arbitrarily larger than the patch size. So there's actually no impediment, the authors claim, to having a smooth and uniform universe. Therefore, we can explain, naturally, both this problem that we call the horizon problem and the smoothness of the universe. So the causal implications of this are necessary, according to the authors, but not sufficient to explain why the energy density distribution was so smooth at the time of last scattering. 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and that was an early portion, an early moment in our current expansionary phase. So how do you get to a very smooth universe at that time of last scattering, smooth to one part in 10 to the fourth? Well, you need some kind of mechanism to do so. And the bouncing cosmology, there is a mechanism associated with the evolution of how the energy density behaves. We're not going to get into the details of the equations, I'll show them, but they actually are not important for our discussion. We can describe them qualitatively and leave the quantitative details to the interested viewer to look up on his or her own. So this factor eta determines the ratio of the uh, different types of energy and consequently will determine how entropy behaves both before and after the bounce. And all that's necessary are some weak conditions on eta, as described in this paper, and that decreases much more during the contracting phase leading up to the bouncing phase than it increases during the expanding phase. So actually, again, you're not thinking about this collapsing like a singularity in a black hole. Again, the whole point of this is manifestly non-singular. And in doing so, we can get rid of these challenges that plagued the early Big Bang model theory until inflation came along. But again, let's remind ourselves, inflation is by no means proven. It has some successes, it has some challenges, and on this channel we're exploring both the successes of inflation and the challenges to it. The new alternative models to inflation, created, I should add, by Paul Steinhardt, who's one of the fathers of so-called new inflation. So uh, it's interesting that one of the fathers of the inflationary theory, recognized universally, no pun intended, as such, is actually one of the foremost critics against inflation. And he has a very, very uh, interesting video with more technical details uh, from the Simons Foundation that I'll put a link to over here. So are there any bounds on how the energy density behaves? Well, there are different epochs that we need to consider. The contracting phase, uh, which there may be a bound on how much it can actually change in order to match the low entropy conditions at the start of the next expansionary phase after the bounce. Uh, but the average value of the energy density during the contracting phase can be much larger than it is during the expanding phase. So these two effects can make the contraction uh, portion of the uh, bouncing universe paradigm a very powerful smoothing mechanism. Some call it a super smoothing mechanism, so that we can start off with a smooth universe, which otherwise is really hard. It's almost another fine tuning problem that inflation predicts this expansion by e to the 60th power, the size of a, the a of t uh, parameter, the scale factor, but it also allows for tiny fluctuations. They come about for completely different uh, from completely different mechanisms. One, the formation of small-scale fluctuations comes from quantum jitters in the inflaton scalar field, and the flattening comes from the overall expansion of the, of the scalar field's value itself. So it is, is accomplishing two things, crinkling on small scales and smoothing on large scales, but the timing has to be just right. If you get crinkly early on, then you inflate, you won't get the universe matching the observations that we see today. So this contraction phase becomes a very plausible mechanism to get a smooth universe. And the authors claim the same arguments apply to the flatness problem. Since the cosmic curvature depends on this eta parameter too at a very steep power, it actually reaches the bounce, the factor becomes small at small scales, and spatial curvature gets exponentially suppressed. Basically, you smooth out the flatness and the small scale perturbations as well. So how do we get small scale fluctuations? Well, like inflation, the bouncing model also features a scalar field. 
the scalar field has tiny quantum perturbations, which are not associated with quantum gravitational perturbations. These are quantum fluctuations, perturbation theory in a flat background, a flat space time. And these tiny fluctuations in the equivalent scalar field produce later super horizon scale, much larger scale fluctuations that were observed initially by Kobe in 1992 and have been observed subsequently by many experiments that led credibility to some process creating from quantum perturbations, not in quantum gravity, but in quantum, uh, quantum field theory, fluctuations in, uh, in this scalar field. So this model unfortunately, in my opinion, has to have a scalar field. You'd like for an alternative to inflation to not have to have a scalar field. You'd like to have it have something completely different. And maybe it does, and we'll talk about that in the context of other models, and perhaps alternatives to alternatives to inflation. So alternatives to the alternatives. Now, how do you convert the scalar field fluctuations into density, also known as curvature fluctuations in the space-time metric that then explain the temperature variations in the CMB, providing the seeds for galaxy and cluster formation? Well, this conversion of the scalar field's quantum fluctuations to density fluctuations have to then match the uh, observed uh, so-called parameters of the power spectrum. These are observations of what's known as the scalar power spectrum N sub S and, uh, and its amplitude A sub S. These are well-measured parameters from the CMB and other uh, cosmic probes. Now, the authors admit that actually some of the first examples in, of bouncing models in the literature produced a lot of different unobserved phenomena from structure formation, mostly called non-Gaussianity. It was later discovered by the current authors that it's not a generic feature of all bouncing cosmological models. So that is not a strike against um, the uh, bouncing scenario. Uh, it's not a proof either, but the question is where do these fluctuations come from? The authors claim this is model dependent. In other words, it depends on your initial model, and so much effort and energy has gone into inflation, I think it behooves us as cosmologists to look at models alternatives to inflation with as much scrutiny um, because they're essentially trying to do something uh, for the betterment of our understanding of cosmogenesis. This would actually have within it a description of what you could plausibly say is cosmogenesis. The next feature that's an important prediction of bouncing models is that we should not observe tensor or B-mode perturbations in the CMB and its polarization. That would be bad news for me if I'm studying it with experiments like the Simons Observatory, right? But actually, it's a testable prediction that can be falsified by an observation of B-mode polarization by the Simons Observatory, by SIP array, CMB stage four. And so in the bouncing model, the contraction before the bounce actually is going to suppress these uh, tensor perturbations that lead to gravitational wave, what we call gravitational wave background perturbations. They'll be exquisitely small in all model models of bouncing cosmology. They may be small in models of inflation. There's no guarantee that we can detect them. But the tensor modes, they are sometimes called primary tensor fluctuations, are actually proportionately small to the size of the Hubble, den the energy density or the Hubble parameter is small at the bounce phase. So these models, bouncing models, make a concrete prediction. There should be no observable B modes, primary, what we call primary B modes. They also make the remark that late time, so-called secondary tensor modes, can be created when density fluctuations re-enter the horizon. Basically, it's enormous amounts of mass are moving with enormous velocities and accelerations. Generically, they will generate gravitational waves, just like LIGO measures. But LIGOs, black holes in spiraling, black hole uh, gravitational radiation are not indicative of something in cosmology. But those would be really suppressed compared to what we would ever hope to detect with experiments like the Simons Observatory, corresponding for you aficionados, of a tensor to scalar ratio of a part in a million, far smaller than any goal of CMB stage four, Simons Observatory or BICEP array. The last part that bears really strong emphasis is that you don't need a multiverse in the bouncing cosmological models. The smoothing phase is the phase of contraction. And it gives the impression that, according to the authors, the evolution should be uniform. But they also hint and warn that that's only an approximation. Quantum fluctuations on super horizon scales can actually change how fast the universe is contracting before the bounce and can advance or uh, enhance the smoothing and contraction phase. So, in inflationary models, most inflationary models have the so-called multiverse problem, um, and they claim that's associated with quantum runaway when a gravitational effect uh, can amplify the volume of rare large fluctuations. 
And so you would expect in such regions to be very, very smooth for a very, very long phase and get more and more rare fluctuations in the inflationary models. So this doesn't occur in the bouncing models. And that's an important um, alternative feature of them. In the bouncing models, the analogous rare fluctuations uh, are able to keep smoothing phases really very smooth and creating patches that are contracting and balance out the number that are rare expanding. And that leaves smaller and smaller volumes, gives them less time for these rare fluctuations to take place. So you don't see a quantum runaway, you kind of have equal measures of both large and small scale patches and their growth rates are accordingly well balanced. Lastly, the small entropy of the beginning of the expanding phase can be explained in bouncing cosmologies, which is a very strong feature in their favor, because the second law of thermodynamics predicts that entropy density must be increasing. So over 13.8 billion years of growth, with a known predictable growth rate for matter and radiation since that time, the universe must have had very, very exponentially small entropy density in its early phases, either at the Big Bang, in the Big Bang or inflation cosmology, or after the bounce. So nowadays, when we think of inflation at higher and higher levels, we have to look back in the future and say that there must be a reason why the entropy would be lower in the early universe. There's no mechanism for that in inflation. It's usually established by fiat called the past hypothesis. And in the bouncing cosmology, the patch that corresponds to our observable universe today was only a tiny infinitesimal fraction of the horizon size long, long before the bounce. So only the limited entropy of the pre-bounce phase is really contained within the region of space-time which will then expand and become our expanding universe that we observe today. And in these models we can account for not only the early expansion but hopefully later expansion as well that we witness in the dark energy and accelerating universe phenomena that we've talked about in this channel. So it's interesting, the authors note, that in the observable universe that we see today, it actually only occupied a volume of space-time a few meters across right after the bounce. And so there's only a tiny amount of entropy contained in that few meter size volume, uh, and that will contribute to the entropy an observer would see one cycle from now. The rest would lie outside of the observer's horizon. So I find this model very tantalizing on many fronts. It's not without its own challenges. As I say, it revolves around a scalar field that has yet to be observed um, and has uh, some challenges, not without precedent. Inflation uses one as well. But having all the successes of inflation described by a theory that doesn't have a singularity, it's almost too good to be true. I've railed against singularities as kind of uh, motivated by this false hope that we would have a unified theory of quantum mechanics and gravity, but there's no letter from God that suggests that it's guaranteed to be so. So a bounce model is useful in many ways. For one, it's always good to have alternatives. It's not good to have monopolies in science, nor is it good to have monopolies in the marketplace, as we know. So in cosmology, typically today, the 300 pound gorilla is played by inflation. And I think it's interesting to have alternatives and study them. It also is interesting when those theories come from creators of the original model of inflation or the, uh, the improved, new improved inflation uh, that Paul Steinhardt contributed to, that also come with all the concomitant knowledge of that model's challenges, but make new predictions as well. In other words, it's one thing to complain about the existence of the current mo favored model, and then it's another thing to have a new model, but it's even better if you can do both, create a new model and understand the lacunae in the previous model. The authors claim this is minimalist in that we only need a uh, contracting phase with Einsteinian gravity and simple stress energy, such as a what they call a canonical scalar field with large kinetic energy density. The bounce is smooth and classical. We don't need anything like quantum gravity. There is a stabilization. There is the um, adherence to the null energy condition and or uh, we, we actually don't have to worry about geodesic incompleteness. So these occur naturally in these models according to the author. And these are occurring well below the Planck scale where quantum gravitational corrections could become important. So in a smooth bounce, we could have our, our cake and eat it too. We could have a universe that matches the observations that we observe in cosmic microwave background and barren acoustic oscillations in late time evolution uh, uh, images such as um, uh, those of Sanyaya Zeldovich effect measurements. And we can also have an explanation for the existence of an expanding universe coming from something, not nothing, as it does in inflation.
So I think it's highly promising. It helps that it makes predictions that we shouldn't see things. I kind of wish, you know, on a personal venal perspective that it would have some predictions that would also keep us going on the Simons Observatory. But it is interesting to think that we are well motivated with the Simons Observatory and we should shrink, uh, strive even harder to look for these imprints because if we do detect BMOs, we will not only motivate inflation, probably beyond a reasonable doubt, but we'll also falsify models such as the cyclic theories of Sir Roger Penrose and these bouncing models such as those of Aegis and Steinhardt. So the future looks very bright, even though the past may have been dim and obscured, our future is getting brighter and brighter. And as I say, with these types of models, we might be able to have our cake and eat it too. I'm Brian Keating, Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics and the co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, thanking you for going into the impossible. If you enjoyed this video, you definitely want to check out this playlist with my cosmology friends talking about the origin and evolution of the universe. And if you're interested in a deep dive in the multiverse, wormholes, and other exotic phenomena, click here and hear my conversation with Juan Maldesena of the Institute for Advanced Study. Enjoy! And don't forget to subscribe for more amazing content.